keto freaks. This is Carl. Do you or someone you know have trouble focusing? You know what I'm talking about. You sit down to read something, try to figure out your monthly budget, write that novel you've been putting off, or maybe you just can't seem to do one task at a time. Well, you may not know this, but I'm a musician as well as a software developer. Programming is a job that requires focus, long periods of uninterrupted work. It's hard for them and for you. I've created music to code by. This is music, yes, but it's specifically and scientifically designed to promote focus. Studies show that when math students were exposed to baroque music between 60 and 80 beats per minute, they did better with comprehension and testing. So, I created more modern music that is neither boring nor distracting, but falls within that tempo range. It's just the right mix. I also made the pieces 25 minutes long. That correlates to research that shows we all get brain fatigue after 20 or so minutes of hard focus. The result is thousands of happy customers. Now, you don't have to be a programmer to reap the benefits of music to code by. It has been known to soothe restless pets, calm fussy babies, and even help autistic kids relax and fall asleep. Listen to some free samples at musictocodeby.net. Well, welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin. I'm in Connecticut in the United States of America. And a couple months ago, I started a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. Yeah, hi. I'm Richard, Richard Morris. I'm in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet for two years this month. And uh, when I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. And uh, within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I also have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and we're going to share the progress of my journey through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in nutritional ketosis, and hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, that's right. We're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. Uh, we're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail. We have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them. We hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite the research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. We yes, love we to eat and cook. And cooking is essential on this diet, yeah. and we're going to share some of the great food that we can eat. As ketogenic people, in every episode, both Richard and I share a recipe for an essential keto meal that we eat regularly. Yeah. You ready, Richard? Yes, I am. All right, let's fire it up and start podcast number nine, The Cholesterol Show. First of all, Richard, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? Nope, nothing, but today's topic is quite a complex one, and I'm sure to get many things wrong. <laughs> yeah, me too, probably. It's uh, Cholesterol is one of those crazy, weird things where studies contradict themselves and uh, people just don't know what's true. And we're certainly not going to claim any absolutism here. No. We're going to look at all of the studies that we've seen and let you draw your own conclusions. That's right. So I should mention at the start that uh, there's multiple different ways of measuring cholesterol, and uh, yes. we're going to use the US style predominantly, which is milligrams per deciliter. Uh, but in Australia, uh, they use millimoles per liter, and uh, in Europe as well, they use millimoles per liter. And to go from one to the other, if you're going from cholesterol uh, milligrams per deciliter US style to uh, Australian or European style, you just divide by 38. And for triglycerides, because it's millimoles, Uh, it's going to be a different divisor. It's You divide by 88 to get triglycerides from US milligrams per deciliter to millimoles per liter. Well, uh, Richard, I'll start with my numbers because I got them back from my doctor. Yeah, excellent. Blood tests. I love blood tests. My blood tests. Yeah. So uh, this is the first blood test that I've done since going on the ketogenic diet. My last blood work was done September 13th, 2015. 
My A1C was 7.4. Right. And I mentioned these at the outset of our show, right? So 7.4, you're, you're in the diabetic range. In the diabetic range, yep. HbA1c is an indicator of how much uh, sugar is in your blood. Yeah, it's an average over three months of your blood sugar. My fasting glucose was 161. My total cholesterol was 199. My triglycerides were 335. Yowzers. My HDL was 42. My LDL was 90. I don't know really what my insulin was. And my weight was 366. And that's last September. Right. Now, let's get to the new numbers. My A1C is 6.1. Nice. Now, 6.1 is out of the diabetic range, but it's in the pre-diabetes range. But remember, this is after only two months That's right. of the ketogenic diet. So, even though A1C is an average of over three months... Yeah, one of those months you were 7.4 or 7.5 or whatever, Yeah, and two of those months you were um, limiting all of your carbohydrates, mm. so it's quite possible that you're almost in a normal range. Right. We'll know in a month's time. Right, exactly. Uh, my glucose now is 136, down from 161. All right. That's fasting glucose. Yeah. But here's the key, and this is why we decided to do a cholesterol show now. My total cholesterol is up. It was 199. It's now 283. Wow. My triglycerides, however, are down. Awesome. 101 points from 335 to 234. That's outstanding. Yeah. My HDL is down five points. That's Interesting. I thought mm. it would go up. Yeah, so did I. My LDL is up 109 points, so 90 to 199. Right. And insulin, uh, while I don't know what it was at the outset, it was measured at 14.8. And my weight today is 322. Nice. So therefore, I've lost 34 pounds. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, so, so there's some good, good stuff there and there's some bad stuff there. And, and I think the good stuff is great. Yes. And the bad stuff may not be all bad. Right. So and that's what we're going to talk about today. Should we pick through some of these things then? Yeah, sure. I, th I think definitely you're right that your uh, HbA1c is, is showing that you've, you're coming down. And if you do another one in a month's time, um, it will probably be down around about the 5.5 five mark. And the longer that you do this diet, the lower it will get until it hits what your uh, genetic base level is. And Now, somebody who is totally normal, non-diabetic, their insulin's normally like three or four or five. It's in that range. Mm -hmm. I think it's pica units per liter or something, but or international units per liter. Mm -hmm. Your fasting insulin, that's the insulin that you first have without having any food, that's showing that you're insulin resistant. Yeah. Now, um, there are people who have insulins at the five mark who are insulin resistant. And the way that you, they tell is two hours after eating 75 grams of glucose, if, if their insulin is over, I think it's uh, 30 at that point, two hours after eating, then they know that then they, they can be diagnosed. Um, but uh, that will come down. Hopefully that insulin will come down. As you're no longer using it, you're becoming hopefully more insulin sensitive. And as you don't have insulin, you don't need to be so resistant and hopefully that will come down. And so you don't need to produce as much insulin. It's interesting to me that the range of insulin is higher even than 14.8. Like, you know, there, there are people with diabetes who have even higher insulin levels. 200, yeah. But I think I've gotten to a good place. And you and I both were just talking before we started recording that we just are amazed at our capacity to not want to eat. Yes. And a lot of our weight loss and, and health these days isn't just coming from the ketogenic diet, but it's coming from this spontaneous intermittent fasting that we're doing. Just yeah. if we, if I listen to my body and eat when my body wants it to eat, yeah. I'll only eat a very little bit of food every day. Yeah. I, I generally don't eat for breakfast because I don't feel like eating when I first wake up. I feel a bit nauseous sometimes. Um, I don't feel like eating. And sometimes I still won't feel like eating at lunch. Yeah. And then I'll have something at dinner and maybe I'll have something two or three hours after that and then that will be it for the day. So that's a, a, that's a 22-2 intermittent fast. Well, Richard, how did you do this week? Um, I've done well, Carl. I had a three-day fast. Uh, I fasted from 8 p.m. on Thursday my time to 8 p.m. on Sunday my time. And I had a 64K bike ride uh, that I left for at 11 a.m. Sunday morning. Wow. Um, or I would have had a 
64k bike ride, but my my chain snapped after three k. Ah, so, <laughs> working so it too up, hard. That's why I know I, I was pushing too hard. <laughs> so so I ended up doing three hours of vigorous gardening instead. Mm. Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, my resting ketones are normally between 0.4 and 0.8 uh, most days. When you fast, generally your ketones go up, and people say that you know your ketones. If you uh, if you're in the early stages of keto adapting, your ketones are sort of like between one and one and a half and three. Well, when I fasted for three days, my ketones only ever got to one millimole per liter. So it's a sign that my my liver is still making a lot of glucose. It's, or is it that there's more ketones going to your brain and your muscles as fuel, and therefore they don't hang around in your system? Well, that's it. What you're measuring is how much is left, right? That's right. You're measuring the the excess capacity that's held in reserve for if you need it. So it makes sense then if your body is becoming more efficient at producing just enough ketones to power your brain and your uh, and your uh, muscles, then there wouldn't be a lot of excess in your blood. Yeah. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah, it does. After you've done, after you've been in ketosis for two years or so, um, it, it would make sense. I agree for mm. your body to become used to knowing what kind of demand it's going to be put on it and, right. uh, and living up to that. And I, I'm pretty much doing that ride every year. Uh, uh, every week, so my body is used to, to expecting to have that kind of energy demand put on it. So yeah, yeah makes sense to me. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, Richard. Thanks. And you feel after three days of fasting, and are you done now with your fast? I'm done now. I had a I had a moderate sized meal. I had a uh, a leek quiche Ooh. with lots of extra bacon, some fennel salad, which will be my recipe for the day, and also I had uh, creamed spinach. Wow. So that was how I broke my fast. And I actually ate too much. I regret doing it. <laughs> I should have sort of, I should have coasted on that low insulin level and just had something fatty, but wow. I kind of thought, no, I, I feel like some protein. So well, good for you, man. Bacon. That's yeah. awesome. So just to repeat what the ketogenic diet is and what we've been eating, we restrict carbs to incidental carbs less than 20 grams a day. I would say in my case, less than five or 10 grams a day. Yeah, that's about it for me too. Green leafy vegetables is about all the carbs that I eat. Uh, enough protein to maintain your muscles. Yeah. And we've posted a link to the keto calculator to have you figure out based on your lean body mass, what that level of protein should be. That's right. And then everything else is fat. And I've noticed, Richard, that most of my friends who do low carb are not eating enough fat. Yeah. One of my friends in general who I saw yesterday has been diabetic type 2 for 15 years. Ouch. And his sugars are high. He eats like no carbs, but he eats a lot of protein, doesn't eat a lot of fat. Yeah. And he's had kidney problems. Yeah. And this is one of the things that we talked about yeah. uh, in the science that we linked to. Yeah. After you get enough protein in your system to take care of your muscles and build muscle mass, the rest of it gets metabolized as food. It becomes glucose. It becomes glucose. Yep. It raises your insulin levels. Yep. And it becomes a dirty fuel and your kidneys have to take the the byproducts of burning that protein and filter it out and it's and it's really hard on the kidneys. Yeah. And so eating fat uh, is just the obvious solution. However, most people just find it distasteful to eat too much fat. Yeah. The truth is all weight loss diets are high fat diets because if you have somebody who is eating um you know 1200 calories a day of pure carbohydrate they're probably mm. burning 3500 uh, kilocalories per day of energy. So you right. subtract 1200 from the 30, uh, 3500 and, and they're, uh, they're, they're, they're probably burning a half a pound of, uh, body fat. Body fat. Yeah. Yeah. All weight loss diets are high fat diets. But the nice thing about a ketogenic diet is that, um, you can choose to, uh, eat more fat, uh, to satiation mm. and not eat as much body fat. You won't lose weight as quickly, but you will still lose weight because because if you're fat adapted, 24-7 you're burning fat, you probably won't feel like eating a lot of fat on your plate. Mm. As you were saying, we, you don't feel like eating a lot of food because you've been eating all day. Right. You know, you've just been doing it internally. <laughs> you've been eating a Krispy Kreme that you ate a decade ago. <laughs> uh, you always bring that up, that Krispy Kreme that yeah, you ate a decade I, ago. I miss that Krispy Kreme. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Uh. <laughs> hey, well, hey, Richard, we got some mail. We got some mail. We're awesome. We're just a and we don't need no Mail. 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 
So this is actually from a friend of mine who uh, is one of the ninjas. Um, I've, I've known her for several years before being a ninja, Nanette the Ninja. And you're talking about the Keto Ninjas, which is a Facebook group. It's a private group that we both belong to. And uh, I suppose we could just ask people to request uh, to join and tell us your story. Yeah. There's no reason yeah. why we can't. Well, you know, it's not an elite group. It's just no. private. All right. So what does Nanette say? So Nanette says, I had a long chat with my doctor about this, this being keto, about a month ago. My GP does, a GP in Australia is just like a primary care physician. Yeah, same here. General practitioner. General, general practitioner. My GP does walk in, take, uh, take whoever is available appointments. And whilst I normally dislike her, that day I only needed a script. So meh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so while she was looking at my history, she noticed the weight loss and asked a few questions, which turned into a... We need full blood panel because of the fat you are eating. Oh, my. Dun, dun, dun. Duh. So um, uh, went back two weeks later for a repeat and ended up chatting with her for an hour as she had researched low carb and immediately made herself a guinea pig. Whoa. Yeah. She could not get over how quickly her weight dropped. Her hunger was gone and she felt amazing. She mentioned that they had been taught in med school that there were two ways the body can drive energy by metabolizing carbs or fat, but that fat was almost immediately dismissed as it was only relevant for patients in starvation mode. Wow. She was genuinely outraged at Diabetes Australia, at the dietitians, and at her training. Isn't that great? It is. So it's quite encouraging. Most of the doctors that I know in the low-carb world are type 2 diabetic or have had cancer and gone into remission thanks to a a low-carb diet. Um, I don't know a lot about the whole reason why you would do a low-carb diet for cancer, but there are uh, very well-credentialed people studying that particular aspect of things. Right. Um, And one of our friends is uh, doing a low-carb diet specifically to- Well, that's that's very encouraging. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about cholesterol from here on in uh, because, well, certainly it started because of my numbers and it was a little scary for me. And, you know, when I tell people about how much fat I'm eating, the immediate reaction is, oh, you got to watch your cholesterol. So- I really wanted to know, Richard, what is the source of the fear of fat? And I think, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's that same Ansel Keys study that had everybody convinced in the, what was it, the 50s or the 40s even? Yeah. That everybody was convinced that eating fat made you fat and eating fat was uh, bad for you. And that high cholesterol, for that matter, is a bad thing. Yeah, I think that was the, the the crux of it all. I went looking for the definitive study that your doctor would have gone to med school and learned about that would have right. identified exactly why uh, cholesterol, total cholesterol, is bad for uh, heart disease. Mm. And I couldn't find anything. In fact, I found things that said quite the opposite. I found there was a, a Norwegian study that was a 10-year study for some 5,000 individuals and that showed that the people who had the highest cholesterol lived longer, had fewer cardiac issues and less all-cause mortality. It gets better than that. Um, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, who you just turned me on to, he's a Scottish doctor and he has this video which we'll publish called Why Cholesterol Does Not and Cannot Cause Heart Disease. He's looked at study after study and concludes that people with low cholesterol are more likely to die of heart disease, which is completely opposite of what yeah. we've been taught. Yeah. If you were to ask somebody in the street, what is a good level of cholesterol? They're going to say as little as possible. But cholesterol, as it turns out, is absolutely necessary for life. Absolutely necessary. And it's weird because uh, other studies have shown recently that Cholesterol isn't all the same, and we've talked about this before. There's in in LDL, which is supposedly the bad cholesterol. Right. There are big fluffy particles, and then there's LDL three, four, and five, which get progressively smaller. Sure. And the theory or the hypothesis is that these little particles, because they're small, they get sort of stuck in the artery walls, and then these microphages come along and feast on them, and the remnants of that feast is sort of like a barnacle and, and yeah. creates that sclerotic, uh, right, arterial sclerosis. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm, I'm not sure personally if I agree with the physical model of this yeah. being a physical attribute of these LDL particles. And are there studies showing this? 
or, or is this just something that's assumed based on the sort of common sense? Because uh, it sounds good. Yeah, pe- I think people people say, oh, well, the difference between this pattern A and pattern B is pattern A is buoyant and fluffy and pattern B is small and dense and therefore there must be something about it being small and dense that's causing the problem. And interestingly, triglycerides is a measure essentially of small, dense lipids, isn't it? Yes. That's interesting because your triglycerides dropped and are dropping further. So we see that happening on a low-carb diet. Let me talk about cholesterol first. Cholesterol is a waxy hydrophobic molecule. So hydrophobic basically is like fat. It's like a fat, but it's waxy. It doesn't mix with water. And so Mm. if you – you know that water and oils don't mix unless you emulsify them. Well, an LDL particle is – a little barge full of cholesterols and fats that move from where they're being generated in the body to where they're being used in the body. Hmm. And so they're like little ferrymen that carry these things around. Right. So so when we talk about HDL or LDL or VLDL or chylomicrons or IDL, these are all different sizes of these little barges that float all of these fats through your blood system. Right. And uh, cholesterol is, is, as you say, you said it was essential for life. It's found in all cell walls. It gives them a rigidity. And just about every cell in your body makes it. So it's, it can't be necessarily a bad thing if all of your body cells make it. Right. Pretty much there's a few exceptions like gonads, but pretty much. And the liver makes a lot of it. And you know that if the liver's making a lot of something, then it's going to be essential for, for metabolism. It also doesn't make sense just from a common sense point of view that if – on the ketogenic diet, uh, all or fasting for that matter, if all of these markers of disease are going down, why right. is this one marker going up? Well, maybe yes. that it's not a marker. Right. Initially, people said, "Well, we're seeing these cholesterol. We're seeing that these plaques that cause the the heart disease. See, heart disease is the epidemic of the twentieth century. Sure, it almost." didn't exist at the beginning of the 20th century and by mm. the middle of the 20th, 20th century it was the commonest cause of death and so and it was killing it also mostly- corresponded with the industrial revolution and the processing of grains and flowers and the and the ansel keys and all of that stuff and are eating more less fat and more grains Right. Well, I, I think the industrial revolution is probably a bit earlier than that, but uh, it certainly it certainly with with large scale industrialization of farming. Sure. I think I think that's certainly the case. Um, right. But it it um, it also coincided with uh, a large uptake of smoking. Mm-hmm. Uh, it also coincided with a large uptake of sugar. Uh, we didn't use a lot of sugar at the turn of the, the turn of the twentieth century. Mm-hmm. At the turn of the twenty first century, we're using a lot of sugar. So, you know, that that's another thing that, that, that happened during that time. And you can look for a lot of these associations. I have I have a personal theory. Um, we might get to that later on, but sure. uh, as to what's causing heart disease. But um, the problem for the medical community was it was killing mostly middle-aged men. And to begin with, it was killing mostly wealthy middle-aged men. Uh, They're the guys you don't want to annoy. Yeah. So it was heart disease was public enemy number one. Mm-hmm. And. The essence of, a, of heart disease is these plaques that build up in the artery that block the flow of blood, that stop blood getting to the heart, and the heart dies. Mm. And so when uh, pathologists went in after the fact to look at these arteries, they found out they were full of cholesterol. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, it's cholesterol's fault, right? Right. And I think that's really where the whole thing came from because I've been looking for the study that says cholesterol causes heart disease, the definitive one, as we say, the silver bullet study that could that, right. that was the the original sin for all this? I can't find it, and I think it was just a simple. We've we've leapt to this conclusion: there is cholesterol in these things, therefore cholesterol must be responsible for it. Right, and I've heard the analogy that if you go to a burning building, you'll see a lot of firefighters there. Yeah. Therefore, if you want to put the fire out, get rid of all the firefighters. <laughs> Doesn't work that way, does it? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is really interesting because while you say you couldn't really find any definitive study that you know would, you know, cause the med schools to preach this don't eat fat thing and cholesterol is a big problem. However, there are, according to Malcolm Kendrick, thousands of studies to the contrary that show just the opposite. And he does in this Why Cholesterol Does Not and Cannot Cause Heart Disease lecture, he points out 10 key contradictions 
which just the top 10 of many. Yeah. And I, I like to highlight a couple of them. There was a study that was done in the United States. Mm -hmm. They looked at the lipid levels. So that's another word for cholesterol. Yeah. The cholesterol levels of patients who had been admitted to hospitals for heart attack. So that should give you a good, at least a good correlation, not a causation. Yeah. No. 232,000 hospitalizations from 541 hospitals. Cholesterol levels were documented in 59% of them. So that's about 137,000 documented cholesterol levels of heart attack admissions to U.S. hospitals. All right. Wow. That's a lot, right? Yeah. So what do you think the mean LDL levels were? Well, if LDL is responsible for heart disease, then that would be high, right? Of course. So 104.9 milligrams per deciliter or 2.6 millimolars. Wow. That's not high at all. No, it's not high at yeah. all. Yeah. yeah. 105 is is really, really low. I mean, it's not really, really low, but it's not considered dangerous. You wouldn't be put on a statin for that. You get put on a statin when you're over about 190. Yeah. So here's another one. Japan. Now, Ansel Keys, which the study that we've cited before, he did this seven country study where he started with, I don't know, 26 countries and whittled his study down to the seven that supported his hypothesis. And this is why it's been debunked. But uh, if you think about Japan, they've always had a very low rate of heart disease. And in the 50s and 60s, they ate very little fat and lots of carbs. And this was one of the reasons why Ansel Keys sort of zeroed in on, on Japan. Sure. But in the last 50 years, they've increased their fat consumption by 400%. Wow. And saturated fat by 200%. The heart disease would have gone out of control, wouldn't it? Right. And this isn't me. This is all Malcolm Kendrick talking here. Hmm. Um, cholesterol went up as expected from 3.9 millimoles per liter to 5.1. Sure. Heart disease fell 60%. <laughs> wow. Well, that, that just shows you that correlation doesn't imply causation, but lack of correlation does imply lack of causation. You have heart disease, you have factor A, which is cholesterol, but there yeah. might be another, you know, in B, heart disease, the end result, there might be another factor, C, which is causing both of them. Yeah, and this is something right. that we have seen in, uh, in weight loss and diabetes. We did, yeah. Yeah, they're both caused by a common factor. And so, there, but, but just because you see people with diabetes are overweight, there's also a lot of people that aren't overweight. Yeah. And there's also yeah. a lot of overweight people that don't have diabetes. So, That's therefore, right. something has to be causing both of them. Yeah, yeah. and it's metabolic syndrome. Mm. Um, stroke rate in this period fell by seven times. Wow. 700% reduction in hemorrhagic strokes. And not just right. hemorrhagic, but the other kinds. So this is a bleed in the brain, isn't it? Yeah, when when those right. are the worst kind, and they were a big yeah. killer in Japan. But yeah. um, the other kind, which is a clotting kind, yeah, like a heart attack. It's a, it's right. a obstructed arteries. Yeah. Yep. So isn't that interesting? And he has he just shows ten of these studies, but he says there you know there was maybe thirty or so that I had to pick through, but yeah. he's read thousands, thousands of studies that show. Uh, a totally different result than what the conventional wisdom is. Now, I'm not saying that this is the end all be all of everything and that, you know, go ahead and eat fat because cholesterol, who cares? I'm not saying that. We're not no. doctors and we no, got to say not. that again. Uh, but, you know, just go and look at the alternative studies and ask the people who are so afraid of fat to show you the science. Yeah. So there's another study that was just published yeah. April 4th, 2016. So this is wow. brand new. Yeah. Seven days old. Genetic causes for high cholesterol are rare. A lot of other causes can lead to high bad cholesterol, such as poor diet and lack of exercise. And coincidentally, this is also one of the conclusions that Malcolm Kendrick has come to based on studies that were done previously. However, this is a brand new one. And let me just read a little bit. Sure. Miami. Genetic mutations that can be blamed for unusually high cholesterol are far rarer than previously thought. Existing in only about 2% of the U.S. population, researchers said Sunday, April 3rd. Previous studies have suggested that as many as 25% of people with high cholesterol, defined as 
low-density lipoprotein cholesterol levels of 190 or higher, could blame their condition on their genes. LDL is widely known as bad cholesterol because it leads to buildup of harmful plaque in the arteries. Quote, many clinicians assume that patients with LDL above 190 have familial hypercholesterolemia mutation as the major driver, said Amit Kara, a cardiology fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital and lead author of the findings presented at the American College of Cardiology Conference in Chicago. He goes on to say, but there are a lot of other causes that can lead to this very high LDL, such as poor diet, lack of exercise, uh, he didn't say it, but smoking is certainly sure. up there. Yeah. A variety of common genetic variants that each have a small impact on cholesterol, but can add up to a big impact when they occur together. Now, just taking the danger of cholesterol off the table, what we thought about inheriting bad cholesterol is complete nonsense. Right. It's very unlikely, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it just goes to show you that cholesterol is one of these things that nobody really has a definitive answer for. Yeah. I have a suspicion that uh, part of this has to do with the fact that, you, you know, if you've got a hammer, the whole world looks like nails. Right. I think we came up with some drugs very early on that were able to lower cholesterol, and we've become obsessed by it because of that. Because you see a lot of these studies that determine the efficacy and the safety of, of these cholesterol drugs, mm. one of the first things that they do is that they have a, what they call a wash-in period at the beginning where mm. they give everybody the drug for two weeks and see if anybody has any adverse effects. Right. And then they remove those people from the group. Right. The theory for why they do that washout is to, to verify that people are willing to take the drug and able to take the drug. Mm. But it also rules out a lot of the issues involved with, uh, with these drugs. And I've got a story story of uh, seven different blood test results that I took over a time from, well, 2004, I had I was first diagnosed as pre-diabetic, right. um, and I went on an Atkins-style diet, and about seven years later, and at that point, my, my cholesterol, my LDL cholesterol was 170, which is, it's high, but it's not, it's not high enough for a statin. Sure. It's not high enough for a doctor to be worried about. And, and my mother and, bro and one of my brothers have high, high LDL cholesterol naturally, and they're mm. both quite healthy. So although it's not a familial high cholesterol, that should be maybe that should be my normal cholesterol. Maybe. And as you get older, your cholesterol slowly inches up. Well, seven years later, in 2011, I developed high bad cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So my LDL cholesterol had increased to 208 milligrams. Mm -hmm. So that's the point. That's above the point where a doctor puts you on a statin. Interestingly enough, my HbA1c, which is my marker for diabetes, is 5.9. So I was still in, you know, I was still in the pre-diabetic range. Right. I had not really moved a lot since 2004. So for seven years, my glucose control was pretty stable. Hmm. And my triglycerides, and we've mentioned this before, my triglycerides were only 71. Now, if your triglycerides are below 100, your LDL is actually a less atherogenic form of LDL. It's called a pattern A type okay. of LDL. And I will link in the show the papers that identify the distinction between these. There is a uh, graph that you can look at that will show you uh, where your triglycerides are. It will show you what percentage of your LDL is atherogenic and what percentage isn't. And at 71, almost none of my LDL was atherogenic. Wow. But because I'd hit this magic 190 point, um, the doctors wanted to put me on a statin. Now, the, now the other thing that we could probably talk a fair bit about uh, about how LDL became the bad cholesterol and HDL the good cholesterol, and, right. and how LDL not all LDL is bad. Some of it's bad, and some of it's benign, and some of it's okay, and some of it's mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. Small dense. But the my HDL at this point in 2011 was 45, which is quite high for me. Natural, naturally high for me. Right. So the interesting thing is when I went on a statin, my blood sugar a year later went from 5.9 to 6.3. So now wow. I'm just I'm right at the top of the pre-diabetes range. Uh, my LDL had dropped from uh, 208 down to 119, so the statin therapy was working fine. Mm. But my triglycerides went from 71 to 146. So now all of my LDL was pattern B atherogenic LDL. Yeah. So literally the statin made my cholesterol 
more likely to cause a heart attack, more likely to cause cardiovascular disease. Huh. But it was also giving me diabetes, or at least I can't tell. I can't say that statins gave me diabetes. There is a correlation, not a causation. That's right. But there is a study that shows that people who take a statin have a forty-six percent greater chance of getting becoming type 2 diabetic than people who take a placebo. But so, that could um, be, as we said before, that could be caused by a third factor, which we are not thinking it of. It could be. It could yeah. be, yeah. But certainly the timing is concerning. And my triglycerides were going up at this point. So this was 2011. My glucose was 5.9. 2012, it was 6.3. 2013, it was 6.8. So now I'd become diabetic. Mm. And then in 2014, it was 7.5%. Hmm. I'll put links to my blog on the show notes, uh, but you'll see you'll see that I was extremely sick, and my HDL had dropped. Now HDL is a better marker. Mm-hmm. HDL is a good cholesterol. It's actually a better marker for cardiovascular disease than LDL is when it's low. Um, you mean? But we yeah, but we've got no drugs. The we we don't really have any 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 drugs that affect heart disease by 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 raising it. So it had dropped from forty five down to twenty nine. Wow. And of course, my triglycerides now, my tri- triglycerides started at 71. I was pretty healthy. I was low carb. I was a little bit overweight to start yep. off with, but you know, I was pre diabetic, but I was, uh, I was exercising a lot and, mm-hmm. uh, and happy and healthy. And my, tri- my trigs were, my triglycerides were 71. By the time my HbA1c had got up to 7.5, my triglycerides were 233. Wow. So I was extremely sick. And that was the point. I, I basically put my foot down and uh, I said, "Look, I've had enough of this. Um, I'm going keto." Yeah. I was. I had two thirty three trigs in uh, May of two thousand and fourteen. By August of two thousand and fourteen, my triglycerides were one thirty seven. Wow. And I know it's amazing. And my HbA one C was five point five. So I went from seven point five in three months to five point five. And when you think, as you say, that that HbA one C is a three month average. I must have been on an average of 5.5 for that entire three months. So here's something. Did you find that your levels of LDL, cholesterol, or cholesterol in general went up for the first few months when you did keto and then came back down? Because I'll I'll talk about some studies that show that this is the case. It's interesting. Um, It's been confounded by me being on statins for part of that time. Huh. And so because I was on statins, my... My LDL, it started out at, at 208. That's why I was put on statins, went to 127, went to 92, uh, went to uh, uh, 77. So it, it was at 92 when I was at my most sick before I went keto, and mm-hmm. then, then it went down to 77. But then that's also I'd been on statins for several years. Yeah, exactly. It's confounded the whole story. And did you stop taking statins? Yeah, so I, I stopped taking statins in November of 2014. Um, so that was about six months after the after I'd been on keto. My HbA1c was 5.2, and it's been 5.2 ever since. That was the day I took went off statins. My LDL was 85, and my triglycerides were 106. Then a year later, so this is a year off statins. Well, in fact, it's March of 2015, March of last year. So it, it would have been six months off statins. Okay. My LDL had gone back up to 204. So it had gone back up to pretty close to where it was before. Okay. So this whole adventure where I got extremely sick, I almost lost a toe. There's a lot of a lot of woe under that bridge. And we've heard but it. We've heard it before. But the uh, that entire adventure of four years on statins, my LDL went down from 208 to 71 and then back up to 204 when I went off the statins. Okay. So, All right. But the, the problem is because I was on statins, we can't really tell if my what my LDL did. It, it was more affected by the statins. So I'm going to link to this uh, article on dietketo.com called Keto Diet and Cholesterol. Is it dangerous? Okay. And I'm just going to jump down to about the middle of the article. Keto diet cholesterol levels improved. There are studies that show, and the studies are linked, they show a positive effect of a keto diet and cholesterol levels. In a study from 2004, the scientists compared a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet with a normal keto diet. The study looked at 120 overweight individuals who already had a high cholesterol level. The study results showed that the people who were eating according to the keto diet lost more weight than the people eating a low-fat diet. The keto diet group also decreased their cholesterol levels more than the group eating according to the low-fat diet. 
What was also interesting in this study was that the HDL cholesterol levels increased for the people who ate according to keto, and LDL cholesterol did not increase. In another study performed in 2006, it was studied how a keto diet impacts people who have a high cholesterol level. In this study, a total of 66 people participated, and they were eating according to a keto diet for a total of 56 weeks. The study showed that the HDL cholesterol levels increased in all people, and also the LDL cholesterol decreased. Other positive side effects were the triglycerides and blood glucose levels also decreased. So the different studies show a totally different result, which can be confusing. Yeah. However, take these things into consideration. The two studies that showed a negative result, which I didn't talk about, which are at the top of, the, of this paper, yeah. were both very short studies. While the two studies that showed a positive result were both longer studies. Hmm. So it seems that on a ketogenic diet, you start losing weight and your blood sugar goes down and everything, your cholesterol profile is going to go up. Your LDL is going to go up. Your triglycerides always come down, but your LDL is going to go up. And then over time, after, in this case, 56 weeks, it drops and it drops and it drops and it drops. Right. Why is that? Well, there is actually a theory that I've heard Dr. Stephen Finney um, give, and I think he's backed it up with a, a study, but I, I don't have it at hand. But but he, he says that when you deposit body fat, uh, because your body fat is going from your liver to your adipocytes, your, your fat cells, in these uh, LDL particles, there's inside those particles the triglycerides and cholesterol esters, and so they travel together. When they get to the fat cell to drop off their package, they drop them all off, and both the triglycerides and the cholesterol esters are stored in your fat cells. And so what happens is down the road, you go on a ketogenic diet, and all of a sudden you're now burning your body fat for fuel. As your fat cells release body fat, they're also releasing these cholesterol esters, which have to float around your blood and make their way back to your liver. And then your liver has to then put them into bile to then pass them out the gut. Yeah. And that's how cholesterol gets out of the body. Excess right. cholesterol gets out of the body. So, so it would make sense then if somebody is uh, losing weight that they're going to have a higher cholesterol level because there's a higher traffic of this stuff coming from fat cells to be to exit the body. Yeah, well, that is a really, you know, it, it sounds right and it sounds like common sense. You know, well, it is a theory and it just goes to show you that there's more than one model of how cholesterol affects the body and essentially how ketogenic diets um, affect cholesterol. Turns out in the long term, a ketogenic diet lowers cholesterol, but many studies have only been done for a short period of time. Sure. So, Richard, you mentioned statins before. You were on a statin. I was on a statin, a generic Lipitor. Yeah, I, I'm glad I'm no longer on it, to be honest. You know, the fact that uh, there's this study that says that, that people are 46% more likely to, and then this is only a relative risk. It's not an absolute risk of 46%, but the relative risk of 46% is still uh, a risk. Um, I'm just glad not to be on it, to be honest. But the world's most lucrative product ever was Lipitor. Really? Lipitor was a statin. It was called Atorvastatin. And its annual sales at its peak were $9 billion a year. Oh, and wow. over its lifetime, it made $73 billion for, uh, I think it was Pfizer uh, or Eli Lilly or one of these. So, you know, it's uh, it, it's insane how much money has been made by these statins. And, of course, uh, as I've said, you know, if you if you have a hammer, the whole world looks like nails. And mm. so we tend to overprescribe these things. Um, at one point, somebody was wanting to put statins in the water supply to reduce heart disease, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's crazy stuff. So Professor Ken Sakaris, whose video we'll link to again, um, so, you know, he says a few things that are that sound definitive about cholesterol. One of them is that statins do tend to clean out the small, dense uh, particles. Yes. And the other thing is that small, dense particles cause heart disease. He said both yes. of these things. Um, yeah. I, I 
he could be right. He's a he's a renowned pathologist in Australia, and uh, mm. and he's got a couple of videos that explain probably better than anybody I've ever heard explain the nature of cholesterol, of how cholesterol moves through the different particle sizes. Yeah. Probably he and Thomas Dayspring are the are the two who uh, give the most lucid uh, explanation. Um, and Peter Atia as well. Peter Atia has his straight dope on cholesterol, which is a oh, very yeah. good uh, text-based one. But he says that the reason that some of these LDL particles become small and dense is because they live for too long. And right. some of that is genetic and some of that is the fact that, that they're overused, they work too hard. And this could be the case with people who have, if you're eating a lot of carbohydrate, you're you're only using a little bit of it for energy and you're turning the rest of it into fat and that mm. all has to be trafficked out LDL in the form of triglycerides and that's why mm-hmm. people who eat a lot of carbs have high triglycerides. Mm. And when you have high triglycerides, you've got to work these LDL harder and for longer. And the longer that your LDL is about, he says that pattern A, the good LDL, lasts for two or three days and pattern B, the bad LDL, lasts for about five or six days. Yeah. So it's just those extra couple of days Give that particle an opportunity to become oxidized and become glycated. If you if you've got a lot of sugar in your blood, there's a good chance that a sugar molecule will stick to the outside, and then it becomes then it becomes inflammatory. So glycation is sugar molecules sticking to yeah, and oxidizing is what oxygen. Oh, okay. Obviously, oxygen is traveling in your blood in hemoglobin, and mm-hmm. um, and there are plenty of opportunities for your proteins to become oxidized. And at that point, they become inflammatory. And this, I think, is one of the core reasons why uh, arterial disease happens is because the arteries become inflamed. And we know, mm. uh, we've mentioned before in previous podcasts on insulin, we spoke about uh, the study where they put um, insulin in the femoral artery of a dog. And in the leg that had the insulin, all of the arteries become atherosclerotic. So right. that just insulin, high levels of insulin will cause your arteries to become sclerotic. Uh, but also anything that causes an inflammation could do that. Or dog's arteries anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But anything that causes an inflammation, it could be these oxidized LDLs. It could be that if your LDLs are not oxidized and they're not naturally inflammatory, they're just bringing good cholesterol for these uh, macrophages to do their job of cleaning up the inflammation. So, so maybe that is what's causing the, the maybe that's what's causing the the linkage, the association between LDL, specifically small dense LDL, and heart disease risk. Because uh, in those cases, it's it's contributing to extra inflammation. Right. It comes there to try and help the macrophage, and it's adding to the inflammation. So, what you're saying is perhaps that the small dense LDL particles, when triglycerides are high. Yeah, uh, are dangerous. Yes, but when you're eating more fat, you're eating ketogenic. Your your triglycerides are low. Yeah, they're not because of the inflammation. Yeah, you cycle through the LDL quickly. It goes out, delivers its payload, comes back to the liver, and gets cleaned up. Well, it makes sense if an artery is inflamed, yeah. and that it may actually have little places where particles can get stuck in them, and plaques can form. Sure, uh, you know that, that's that's a common sense idea too. And again, these are just thoughts. Hypotheses, yes. I would love to see some uh, research on it. But I know for a fact, I can, I'm can. i pretty sure that we, if we want to sacrifice a dog, we can prove that insulin causes uh, atherosclerosis. So mm. I'm sure this is a multifactorial thing. Yeah, as most of this is. And it, yeah. it has to be because uh, there hasn't been a direct causation proven yet. We've we've had drugs like uh, there was a drug, an Eli Lilly drug that uh, there was a study, and the drug has got a funny name, Evacitrapib. Oh right! Uh, but it's a CTP inhibitor, and it basically inhibits the ability for HDL and LDL particles to to share cholesterol and triglycerides with each other. And and what it actually does is it lowers, it raises HDL and it lowers LDL. And uh, they found out that uh, that su- they, su- they were surprised, in fact, that it had absolutely no difference in the rate of cardiovascular uh, disease in the two populations. And the results of this study just came out April 5th. Right. So that's even more recent. Yeah. Even more recent. An experimental drug that greatly increases levels of good cholesterol has no effect on heart health. No, it increases levels of good cholesterol and decreases the bad. It decreases the bad by 37% and increases the good cholesterol by 130%. So it does all of the things that conventional wisdom says you should do, yeah. all the things that a statin does, right? Yeah. And yet there's no effect 
on heart health. So these things are not causes, they're symptoms. That seems logical to me. I would think so, yeah. All right, Richard, it's time for recipes. Heard you say you're due for a little. Recipes. Recipes. Okay, Carl, so what have you got for us this week? I've got something yummy. Yum. All right. Well, as you know from the Sweetener Show, Mm -hmm. we did a show on artificial sweeteners, that results may vary with artificial sweeteners. Some people, a lot of people say stevia is good and doesn't cause problems, but there's an aftertaste. And some people like Splenda and some people like Aspartame. I would recommend against using that. But (laughs) turns out in my case, xylitol is the magic bullet. I can tolerate xylitol. you like the dog killer. <laughs> I, I, I can tolerate it. Yeah. And I don't have dogs, yeah, okay. so it's no problem for yeah, me. That's, there you go. That's good. So what I figured out was I could make a chocolate mousse with whipped mm-hmm. cream. It's very simple. Whipped cream. Yep. Dark cocoa powder. Yep. And xylitol. Nice. And I just whip the cream up, put in that cocoa. It turns practically to butter right there. Put in a little mm. vanilla and some xylitol, and I don't have me- I don't have measures because I eyeball it. You know, after a yeah. while of cooking, you just know how much is is enough. And uh, I whip that up. Now, what's going to happen with the xylitol granules that I have is they have to melt, so you really got to put it in the fridge overnight. Otherwise, you're going to get crunchies. Before you whip it or after you whip it? After. I mean, what you can do is take a little cream and heat it up and dissolve the crystals in the cream over heat. Right. You could do that yeah. too. But what I did is I just put it in the fridge overnight and any time where I'm feeling I need something sweet, mm. man, I just grab a spoonful of that. Nice. And it's like chocolate heaven. And I cannot tell the difference between xylitol and sugar. I can't. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's good. And and you've tested your blood sugar and you oh, have yeah. no, it has no effects on you. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's notorious for not having an effect, so uh, that's great. And it's very sweet. And uh, and mm. and the thing is, I can have a bite, and that's enough. Uh, it's yeah. weird. I I don't understand. Who am I? No, I don't want to eat. It used to be. <laughs> it used to be that if you have the, the, uh, Professor Noakes says, you can always tell somebody who's insulin resistant because they can't have a block of chocolate in the house. Yeah, they eat one square, and they've got to finish the whole thing off. Right. And I'm not like that anymore. I'm quite happy to have half a square. Yeah. You know, it's uh, all I want is the taste, you yep, know? Yep, that's it. So that's my recipe. I will formally awesome. write up a ratio recipe because there's a lot of people who don't like to experiment with ratios. Yeah. I'll formally write something up. I'll go make some today and we'll we'll add it to the show notes. I'm going to formally go make that because that sounds awesome. Oh, it's just so <laughs> simple. It's just chocolate, yeah. mousse, pudding, whatever you want to call it. That's awesome. All right, Richard, what's yours? So my recipe is actually slightly but not too much more complicated. It's a go-to salad yeah. that I use probably three three times a week at least, and it's a fennel salad. Oh, yeah. Now, most people are used to uh, fennel fronds or fennel seeds, but the bulb of the fennel is actually it delicious. It's got an aniseed flavor like fennel. Licorice. Like the, the fennel seeds, but it's, it's, it's much more subtle, and it looks like an onion. And it grates up a little bit like a like a, an apple almost, yep. and it's mostly watery. It's got almost no carbs in it. It's extremely good for making a salad. Mm. So what I do is I have a mandoline, which is a uh, device for fine finely slicing. But you yeah. could use a a, a Kitchen Aid or whatever. Sure, uh, I use a Benrin, a Japanese mandoline, or even a cheese grater. Cheese grater. You could work. use a cheese grater. Yeah. It'll do just as well. The reason that I use my mandolin, though, is because I'm a snob and I like my Japanese mandolin. And you get those thin slices, right? Yeah, perfect juliennes. And you got to watch out for those mandolins. Don't use your hands. Always use the block because they're notorious for cutting people's hands off. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they are. And and these Japanese ones are sharp as so. Oh, yeah. But what I do is I slice up. I put the, the julienne blade on, which is one – it's got little forks that, that come up. And so basically it's going to make little matchsticks yeah. of this fennel. Great. And I grate the fennel. So a large bulb of fennel is uh, worth about eight plates. Each of my plates is about two tablespoons of, uh, of the salad. Okay. And into the salad, I add a zest of a lemon or a lime. Okay. So I just shave that off. Uh, that's just because we're going to use the lime juice in the dressing. All right. Um, you may as well use the outside of the, the, the zest of it because Love zest. it's more pecan. Great yeah, flavor. Love it. And I chop about a 
about two teaspoons of cornichons, which are small little gherkins or pickles. Yep. Um, uh, they've got a little bit of carbs in them, but I slice them really fine. Sometimes I'll use the mandoline to do very fine slices. Uh, and then I'll uh, slice a teaspoon of capers. Now, capers are little fruits that have a salty, salty flavor to them. and They're actually uh, flower buds, aren't they? I think they are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they're commonly used in tartar sauce. So right. If and also sometimes anchovies are packed in oil and capers. And they pack a lot of flavor and they're very good for you. They're full of vitamin C. Yep. So I chop a, a teaspoon of these finely and, and spread it through the, the salad mix. And then I get two teaspoons of blueberries. Nice. I wait until blueberries are on sale because uh, there's a glut of blueberries um, sort of towards the end of summer and you can get them very cheap. And I freeze them and keep them in the fridge in the freezer. So I have blueberries all year round. In fact, I have blackberries that I I pick myself and 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 all sorts of berries in my fridge because berries are a fruit that have very little sugar in them. Mm. And so I have maybe one or maybe maybe a teaspoon of uh, maybe six berries be- you know, in the entire thing. I slice these blueberries very fine, mm. distribute them through. Great. And then I get some. I get a, a tablespoon of pepitas. Pepitas are what toasted. Uh, they're pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds, yeah. They're pumpkin seeds, and so and they're very low carb as well. Yeah. This is to give you a crunch element in the salad. Crunch is very important. So we've got all the different flavors and all the different textures. Now the dressing, um, I use the juice of a lemon. I use some nut oil like uh, macadamia oil or walnut oil mm-hmm. or almond oil. Mm-hmm. And uh, I use about equal amounts. So whatever juice I get out of the lemon, I have about equal amounts of the oil. Uh, a half a teaspoon of uh, mustard, seeded mustard, and I put uh, uh, three tablets of Splendor in there okay. because I'm, I'm trying to replace honey, which would right. normally be in this kind of right, dressing. Right, right. Um, if I find that if I just have the lemon, it's just too tart. Yeah. And you could probably use xylitol mm. um, uh, or erythritol or stevia, but you're just trying to cut the sharpness of the, of the dressing. Very good. So I do that in an old jar. I shake it up. I toss it over the dressing. I toss the salads. Uh, so that it's uh, delicious. It's delicious. I'm getting and, hungry now just thinking about it. And the nice thing about this salad is that it can take a beating. So you can put it underneath hot meat. And like, so I sometimes, I'll sometimes uh, plate my meals uh, with a tube and I'll put two tablespoons of fennel salad on the bottom and I'll put uh, a serving of 100 grams of uh I've pulled meat on top of that, pull the tube away, and I end up with a perfect stack oh, with the, the salad underneath and the pulled meat on top. And I tell you, this fennel salad, Shay Richard, I uh, know Shay Richard. <laughs> so this is this is this is my uh, my Michelin star. <laughs> Did I tell you how my carnitas turned out? Uh, it probably probably be nice on a fennel salad. I think. Oh my god, it was. Let me just tell you, the carnitas worked out great. I did just as I said. I I used four pounds of lard. Yeah. And I, I used oranges and limes. I ended up putting a couple of limes in there, like a whole bunch of garlic, uh, salt. And I even put mushrooms in because I wanted some more earth tones because mushrooms are very earthy. Yeah. And all of this just cooked very slowly in a Dutch oven, a big cast iron Dutch oven. Mm. And how I served it was great. I had bib lettuce or Boston lettuce. Right, yeah. And that is, it was hydroponic. I found hydroponic Boston lettuce at my local (laughs) grocery store, which means there was no dirt, right? And you could just peel these leaves off and they were these perfect- You don't have to wash them or anything. No, you don't have to wash them. Perfectly round leaves with a nice crease in the bottom. Lovely. Spread a little um, guacamole and sour cream on the bottom. Oh, yeah. And then chopped red peppers for crunch. Yeah. Right, Lovely. chopped red yeah. bell peppers for a little crunch and a little more flavor, and I put the carnitas on top. Oh yeah, I also had some Oaxaca cheese. Yeah, of course, the cheese, the cheese layer yeah. is necessary. The yeah. cheese layer, and then the stuff on top of that. I don't like this trend of when you get tacos, like even fish tacos, they put the fish on the bottom, then like the slaw, and then an aioli on top because yeah. that's on top. That's going all over your face. Yeah, exactly. You should put the sauce on the bottom. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yep, I Put agree. the sauce on the bottom, and then, and then it's contained. It. Yeah, yeah, you're going to taste it perfectly yeah. fine, but it's contained. Yeah. It's not going to go all over your face. So, and and my daughter came over for dinner. Oh, she's gone keto, hasn't she? Yeah, my 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 daughter. So the next generation, your next generation, has has gone on to the ketogenic diet, and she's to- she's all in. Um, yeah, wonderful. We had a party for my brother here at the studio, and I have a recording studio which doubles as a social hall in <laughs> uh, New London, Connecticut. 
and uh, we had his 50th birthday party. It was a surprise party, but there was cake and there was lasagna and there was meatballs and there was all sorts of stuff. I bought some chickens, some rotisserie chickens, pulled the meat all off and just put it in a, uh, a bowl so that the ketoers could eat that nice. and also make yeah, everybody else can make sandwiches from it. Sure. And it turns out that I have now a lot of bones and skin and wings that I can <laughs> yeah. make for use for bone broth. You make stock out of, yeah. Lovely. But the but the story is that my daughter was very diligent. She didn't eat any cake, she didn't eat any bad stuff. And it was hard for her because she's only like five or six days in. Yeah. But uh but she did it. Way to go, Emmy. That's impressive. Very impressive. That's what I got, man. That's a show. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I, I'm so glad we did the show. The timing was perfect for me, and uh, it was great doing all this research. Of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, uh, some more research that you've found to either support or refute what we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com, or just leave a comment on the website yeah. at twoketodudes.com. That's it, Richard. Okay. Thank see you. you, Carl. See you, Richard. and see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Yeah.